to what's happening in a cache. Where is it? What does it do? What does my data look like? Big questions. It's in memory. Um, it's in your application memory. If you restart your tab, if you restart your app, it's all gone. Um, that's like the basics of it. <laughs> and then your data, is it just like copied data? Is it what you queried? Not quite. It's a representation of it. Um, and we'll get back to this in a second, but you know, um, it's good to know, because if it was exactly your data, this would be a very different talk. Getting the data, right? Where does it come from? How do we know how to get it? And that's where fetch policies come into play. Um, they tell us where to get it, not quite you know, how to get it, but you know, is it coming from the cache? Is it coming from the network? Is it a combination of the two? Um, and like, these can solve a lot of problems for you. Uh, I'm going to go through them really quickly. Um, but cache first is the one we probably all use because it's the default. Right? It'll go to the cache. Is all the data you're querying there? Grab it from the cache. Give it to me. Otherwise, go to the network. Um, cache only. Very self-explanatory. Uh, cache and network. Very interesting. In, like the highest consistency you could have, right? Go and get this data, you know, update it after the fact. Um, network only, and then no cache, which, you know, I guess you could use that one. They're going to do it so much better than I'm going to do it. So here I am trying to do it. Mm. So it happens in three steps. Um, you get your data, we look at it, and we split the data into entities, individual objects, right? Anything that has an identifier, we split off and pulled out and you know, removed from the, all the, these other objects. And you'll see like there's pixel image, there's this other pixel, and then there's that other object you can see in their pixel matrix that returns a list. You can see that it doesn't have an identifier and it's not outlined in red. So it's not going to be broken off. It'll get cached under its parent object, which is pixel image. Um, so now that we have those objects, we're going to assign them unique identifiers, right? Um, and I, I think someone was talking about this yesterday, but I'll reiterate, type name plus identifier. So if you have an ID on your object, it'll take type name plus that, and that'll be your cache key. Um, except for sometimes you don't have an ID. Sometimes you have these other random fields you want to use. Um, so you can use the key fields API to define another way to create your key. Let's say it's ID plus value, ID plus anything, maybe no ID, value, date, timestamp, but it just has to be consistent, right, and stable. So you can, you know, fire this later on in your life cycle and find these objects again. Um, so you could use anything to really create this. So we have IDs, we have objects, let's put them back together into this flattened data structure, right, and what the normalized cache will actually look like. Um, and it, so it turns out looking like this. Like this is that uh, original object we had, right? We broke it down, we gave it IDs, and we put it back together. And it probably looks relatively familiar where it's just a lookup table, right? We have these IDs, we have the objects. It's small, it's deduped, and they're easy to find and easy to access, right? Um, and that's really what your normalized cache looks like under the hood. And you know, it's nice to know where it's like, it's not gonna make a huge difference, but when you think about it, it's like, oh, my object doesn't have an ID, it's gonna be cached under its parent. Um, you know, it's good to keep in mind. You probably like queried some data and it updated your UI. And it was like, that's so sweet. Why can't it always happen? Um, and it can't always happen because sometimes the cache has no idea what to do with, you know, your mutation or your new query coming in. So when data comes back from like a requery or from a mutation response, one of two things will happen. It'll get merged into the existing objects. So finds that ID, merges it in with your new fields, right? Um, taking the new fields, overriding the old ones, um, if there is a new change or something. Or it'll add it, right? And the add is the part that kind of sucks because that's not you know, gonna automatically update your like, UI often. So when do the automatic updates get applied? The easiest one, um, I have a single entity, I'm changing it, I'm returning it with its ID and its changed value, right? Very simple. I liked this thing. It updated it in my UI automatically. We loved it. It was sweet. Same thing goes for like multiple entities. You have to return all of them, even the ones that weren't changed, um, with their IDs and with the changed fields, right? And it'll go and update that, and we're really happy. Uh, and then when we're not happy is when it doesn't automatically update. For example, we have this product. We're going to favorite it, right? Um, but the change we want to happen in the cache is not related to that response data. And like, this one seems very obvious, but there's like kind of a tangential relation where it's like, I favorited this product, I have a number of favorited products, like maybe that should update, 
But of course it won't, right? You'd have to write an update function. You change that number of favorited products that were updated. How about we didn't return all the objects after we changed a list, right? We only return the changed ones. Um, the cache has no idea what to do, where it's like, were the objects that you didn't return deleted? Are they supposed to be there? Should I merge, right? It makes no assumptions about you want to, what you want to do with your data. You have to be very explicit. So in this scenario, you'd have to write an update function, garbage collection and eviction. Um, this is like, you probably wouldn't use this very often. I haven't used it very often, um, but I think it's super cool, so I'm going to talk about it. Right? We have memory. Our objects are sitting there. We're not using it actively. Right? We want to clean out things that shouldn't be there at the end. Let's say they're not reachable anymore. Let's say it's a query we made where you know, these objects aren't being actively used by our application. We want to clear them out. Um, you do it like this. Um, and I love this API because it's so small, so succinct. You know, those are the best. Uh, and it'll return you a list of all the IDs it removed. Um, but what does that look like in reality? But you can see the, the cache size, it's 212 items in the cache. How did I calculate that? I looked at the number of keys. It's not really a representation of how big the cache is, but you know, for this situation, let's say it is. Um, we're gonna change Pikachu's color, right? Boom, now it's shiny. We have 419 objects in the cache. What happened, right? I queried, I made each of these pixels have their own identifier, and the parents all have identifiers, and all got regenerated. It's a contrived example, but in this situation, you had all this new data come in. Um, and we have all these objects that are not used anymore from the previous query. Um, what the garbage collector does is it traverses the, ta <laughs> traverses the tree of these objects, finding each one, visiting everything it can until it gets to the leaf nodes, marks them as visited. Everything that wasn't visited gets removed. What if we want to evict whole objects? Like garbage collection is one thing where they're not reachable. We can get rid of them, right? Clean up. But that situation from before where like we remove something, right? We delete something with a mutation, but it's still in our cache, right? You can use the eviction API now. Just like go through, evict an object based on its ID. Very simple, right? Um, and it'll, it'll get rid of it for you. You could go a level crazier and just evict individual fields, which I, I haven't seen a reason to do it. I haven't done it personally, but if you're wild enough, you could definitely do it. Yeah, that's it. That's the life cycle of an object, right? Like keeping it in mind when you're working with your objects, when you're even writing your schema, right? Everything should have an ID. Everything should be queried with an ID if you want it to be updated like that. Um, and that's it.